come on online now and delivering online is Professor Kingsley Dixon. Uh, Kingsley is from the Curtin University and he's basically telling us about the fact that WA has, according to Kingsley, and I didn't realise this, the most extensive and intensive prescribed burning policy of any other region globally. Uh, that's a statistic we should be proud of, but who knows, but you know, Kingsley's going to tell us all about that. So he's going to tell us about new science that highlights the risks to ecosystems of the large scale burning in comparison to traditional burning practices. So, the fairly common thing going here. So, thanks, Kingsley. I'm, I think you're online. Thank you so much for attending, even though you couldn't get here in person. Great. Hey, and, and, and thanks to everyone and to the, the great lineup of uh, speakers. Um, as you can probably gather, um, it's best that I'm not with you. I've got the latest Perth bug um, and uh, um, come out of my sick bed, dosed up with pedal. Um, so uh, uh, at least uh, I'm enjoying the presentations. Um, my my life in the Kimberley goes back a, a long way. I, I had a slide in of me um, on a, a, a flight, an, an MMA flight. For those that are old enough in the room, they'll know what that means. But I deleted that one. Instead, I put this one in. This is uh, uh, a guy called Joe Smith who I worked with on a place uh, – called the Mitchell Plateau when it was uh, Amax, which was, of course, pegged for bauxite. And um, that was my first introduction. That was in 1979, uh, so finishing off PhD student. And in that uh, period, I've stayed connected with the Kimberley as the Kimberley gets under your skin. And uh, that's Joe under, uh, of course, the, the Acacia Dunny Eye, uh, the wonderful waddle. But we gradually, over time, uh, learnt to appreciate the diversity of the habitats. Uh, that's uh, colleague Greg Keary from the State Herbarium with us working on uh, many of the smaller annuals. And um, we, we discovered ecosystems that have been ignored, such as uh, superficial flats, uh, sandstone pavements, which, of course, Matt and Russell Barrett have continued, who are both my PhD students at Kings Park. And um, over that time... Um, we also worked extensively on the monsoon vine thickets. These are the things that sit as very rare relics of uh, a much wetter climb across parts of the Kimberley. And during that time, we got to understand that the diversity of the Kimberley was really astonishing. At the time we visited, the, the flora of the Kimberley was estimated at something around 800 species. We're now well into the 2000s and, and climbing rapidly as the paper discovery continues across that region. Um, the programs that we've still got going, and uh, thanks to some generous sponsorship and support um, by uh, uh, some benefactors, um, we continue the work that uh, I started at Kings Park and have now moved to Curtin University in 2015 on carnivorous plants, uh, our water lily work, orchid ecology and conservation of all of those groups. And Native Bee Ecology in the Kimberley um, has looked at all sorts of aspects of the, the extraordinary native bees and we're now moving into trying to understand commercial production, particularly with traditional owners of uh, native uh, bee uh, honey production. Seed Ecology and Restoration of the Kimberley Species is one of our biggest programs and we're working across a number of TO groups um, and particularly with the mining industry um, on trying to solve issues on restoration. Native pasture development and particularly uh, understanding soil carbon values of biodiverse and particularly native pasture reinstatement um, is a program that's now just in its first year and is uh, growing. And that's work that's happening along a number of major pastoral leases along the Gibb River Road. Um, mine site restoration. We first got involved with Argyle back in 1995, uh, worked on spin effects. And today I'm very pleased to be working with the Golgenium Trust and uh, the TOs on developing a state-of-the-art, in fact, West Australia's first fully traditional owner operated uh, native seed business, which we'll see growing. The images I've put up there are just some of those things that uh, I think get me up to the Kimberley a lot. The image on the left, the, the wonderful big batch of uh, water lilies, but the big white one, when I got this image sent down from the Kimberley, 
I sent it off to my colleague at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Q, and we're now desperately trying to get specimens of that because uh, not only is it probably one of the world's biggest flowering water lilies, but it's potentially a, a whole new species. The one in the middle is uh, an image that was just sent to me this week uh, from uh, the um, San Diego Botanic Garden. Um, it's an image they've discovered of potentially a new water lily hybrid sitting in the Kimberley, um, whether it's a hybrid or a new species, but certainly they're very keen to understand that further. So the pace of discovery is continuing. And this is our work just uh, three weeks ago up uh, at the main pit with the traditional owners, the Gidja and Mirawong people, where we're helping them understand what mine closure might look like. So I'm very heavily connected. My program that uh, I'm personally running is uh, one with uh, three years sponsorship from the Australian Orchid Foundation, understanding uh, tree orchids, the susceptibility to fire, but also training uh, a whole lot of uh, local TOs uh, in the Beagle Bay area uh, further north um, in how to uh, grow these orchids under tissue culture methods so they can grow their own plants and run their own nurseries not only to put them back into the wild, but also to uh, provide them for tourists. So the Kimberley has gone from being the Cinderella to the southwest biodiversity hotspot to becoming what we now refer to as one of the world's last great wildernesses. It's complex geologies that we've driven diversification that we really didn't understand and we're only still just starting to understand those complex ecologies and geologies which extend for the full duration of the history of the evolution of flowering plants but the rocks of course date back to almost two billion years but what we're finding is there is not only a high level of unique species because of the complex mosaics of vegetation and there's a, a number of bioregions recognized that's an image c but also the complex watersheds and the complex way in which the soils have developed across the system means we drive pattern and diversification at a scale and pace that we're now really starting to just unravel. So, for example, we, we have uh, uh, 65 animals and 350 plant species at least, and, and I would guess the numbers are going to be much greater uh, over the next decade, particularly with the new uh, metagenomics, the DNA fingerprinting that's happening that uh, are totally endemic to the Kimberley. I interestingly, the number of studies are showing that we're also finding what's called hidden diversity. We call it cryptic diversity. That is species embedded in species. We're seeing that, for example, with the spinifexes, that across a river valley, spinifexes can be completely different um, genetic material, yet morphologically they can look the same. So it looks as though it has more hidden species than probably anywhere else uh, uh, in Australia. So this really leads to an important uh, aspect of my presentation, which is fire for all species. How, how in executing fire on our landscapes can we be certain that we protect this diversity and the future diversity so that we understand that uh, the one-size-fits-all policy is probably needing to be very nuanced? And, and a number of the presentations have spoken to that very eloquently. Presentation um, um, is built up with assistance from Tristan Campbell, who's uh, my research officer, and we have a special guest appearance by someone in the room, Donnie Imbalong. He's sitting right up the back and trying to look insignificant, I think. Um, this is interesting. Fire is high in everybody's mind. This is an image I took uh, just before COVID locked the world down. Of all places in the main palm house at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q, um, fire is a big issue all over the world. Fires are now occurring all through the Arctic as the Arctic is drying, and we're seeing some of those ancient peats starting to combust. An astonishing 340 million hectares of the Earth's surface burns annually. This has important consequences because almost all of those are man-made ignitions. Um, but what happens if you're not careful with the way you execute and prosecute fire in landscapes? I want to use an example from uh, 
down here in Perth, uh, which is an area that I managed for 32 years, which is Kings Park's bushland, one of the most revered pieces of bushland uh, in Western Australia. And I'm just going to talk about what David Bowman talked about, which is the insidious grass fire cycle. Velt grass was introduced, we think, somewhere in the 1920s. It's from South Africa. It just found that it wasn't competed, outcompeted by other native grasses and, as a result, got established in parts of Kings Park. They're the little red dots. We know these because we've got all that detailed mapping. All the green areas are bushland. So this was native Banksia, Jarrah, mixed woodland with a rich understory of species <clears throat> and a rich wildlife, particularly many wren species. 1939 onwards, prescribed burning started to be used to control fires in the park. All those fires were arson ignitions. So that by 1945, we can see belt grass has started to spread. Sometimes this was deliberate because it was used as an early source of income uh, to sell to the then horse-drawn carts and stuff that, that were in early Perth. From 1945 up until 1987, of course, we turned Kings Park's wonderful woodland with a mixed woody understory into essentially a South African savanna. What we lost were key dominant tree species. A number of our key banks here has vanished with major consequences for the bird life and major fire sensitive understory species, including many of the key winter flowering plants that are important for supporting many of our native bees. The fauna was lost and there were multiple attempts to reintroduce the wrens, but they had long since vanished from that system. So without care and attention, when you prosecute fire on landscapes, we know there are consequences. And the Southwest, I think, is a living case of where that management has, has wreaked havoc. What we also found with velt grass, and this happened with a visit by the then Premier following a large and catastrophic wildfire in 1997. He asked, what should we do? And we said, we need to control velt grass. We had a selective control measure, but it would cost almost a million dollars a year to do the selective control. What we did was we got the money. We were able to control those fine fuels. And we've now, over that period of time, reduced the incidence of large and catastrophic wildfires mm -hmm. uh, to almost just one-tenth of what they were prior to that uh, control of those fine fuels. So if we look at the fire maps, and we're seeing a lot of these, burnt in the last five years is all the yellow areas. You can see a little bit in the southwest, most of it's cleared, but you can see a little bit, we'll see some illustrations of where those numbers are coming from. But we can see much of the uh, arid north and the arid tropical Kimberley region are subjected to reason a fairly uh, heavy and intense frequent fire. The issue is that many species need long fire-free intervals. And we can see that that was already illustrated back in 2009. There was uh, the first major publication. This was done by the ancestor of, uh, of what is now DBCA, the Department of Environment and Conservation, where they synthesised, um, and the, the plant stuff was done by Norm McKenzie and uh, uh, Alan Burbage and Kevin Keneally and a few of the other luminaries, where they really started to try and understand how do we protect the Kimberley, given the knowledge that we have about the species and the ecosystems. And in figure five of that, they really pointed out, and this is their map of fire frequency in for 15 years to 2005, the alarming high frequency a fire that was happening across that fire was one of the number one key risks to the region. They came up with uh, these sort of uh, current and target states of uh, what you needed to think about. What you see with the size of the boxes is the degree to which you need to manage those. So, for example, if we look at the current state that they recorded, fire is big, grazing was big, weeds were big, predators were big. If you can manage those, you can then manage the target state and get back a rich and diverse biodiversity. 
What's interesting with the discussions that we've had on uh, uh, the station properties that have had that discrete management, you can actually get that system to work fairly well. It's about how you create those mosaics and create that engagement <laughs> across a broad stakeholder group in the Kimberley. But at least this was being talked about in 2009 and is well understood as being symbolic. So what have we learned from the Southwest that are lessons for the top end? Well, I did say, and it's very controversial, we are the capital of prescribed burning. On the left, you can see the burning practices that we now have in the 30% of the Southwest that remains uncleared. We only have 30%. That's why we're now a biodiversity hotspot. From 2005 up until our most recent mapping, we now impose fire across a broad landscape. And we've got interested in how does this frequency impact species, ecosystem resilience, and also resilience to wildfire. And the information is starting to, to come out, and I'll illustrate one of those papers in just a moment. What's important to realise is that when you combine dry burning and wildfires, you don't find any areas of our ecosystems in the southwest that haven't had fire in, in the time periods that would be necessary to ensure all species survive. For example, the Jarrah forest alone, which is the major biome that's still uncleared, requires some species require up to 81 years fire-free intervals to ensure they have fully reproductive populations. This is things such as the Mardu, a small native marsupial. Now, I'll... All of that burning is based on um, a, uh, prin the principle of uh, a paper published in 2009, which found what you see on the plot when they looked at a particular region on the south coast, they found that the larger the area burnt on a six-year average, the less the wildfire risk. Now, the leverage was quite small. That is, you had to burn 2,000 square kilometres to reduce wildfires by approximately 500 square kilometres. But that's now driven what's called the 200,000 hectare target for the southwest, which has then resulted in, of course, large-scale burning that we now see. Now, this burning um, uh, meant that we were very interested to understand, firstly, the protective values, and there's uh, a new paper that's come out that shows those uh, protective values and the high risks that you lose protective value when you have high frequency six year rotations. But we were also um, interested in looking at that paper again, that was 1953 to 2003, and reworking the data completely. And this has just come out uh, in uh, the last month. We looked at 1953 to 2021 and used DBCO's new and very much more accurate mapping. And when we did the analysis over the policy area, we found no correlation. In fact, we found the periods of the largest wildfire were when there were the most prescribed burning, which you can see in that red rectangle just there. So we were starting to see an inverse of what was being used uh, in, in the burning patterns. Um, that's where the paper is. What this means, and what I'm trying to illustrate here is that quite simply, often if models are adopted that don't look at the fuller picture in a broader context and across broader regions, the danger is that you adopt one principle and you may in fact cause irreversible damage. This um, means that uh, we now operate a burning cycle in the southwest based on six-year fuel ages. So it's no longer fuel amount. So this is Wandu Woodland, uh, burnt last year uh, near one of my, near a farm that uh, I have. And as you can see, very little mass. But because of the aerial incendiaries, what we see is a preferential loss of mature trees because of the physics of the way fire burns with a lack of wind across that system. And, and that paper is currently under review. Also, the pattern of burning, um, the principles are that it's small and it's nuanced and it's cool, but in practice, um, the creation of pyroaccumulus, particularly for our forest systems, is a fundamental driver 
of, of those ignition patterns. So we see a very different outcome to what those original models might have, might have illustrated. So let's look at the East Kimberley and look at fires since 2007. We've seen some of these maps already. These are our, our own interpretations um, from the data that we've been able to, to glean. Prescribed burns on the left, you can see that the deeper the colour, the more recent the burning. And we can see that over the period of time, we're starting to see very large areas subjected to large-scale burning. We can see wildfires on the right, um, and we can see that they occur. Um, it's difficult for us to get very accurate maps on those. What we've been able to do is to look at the incidence of those wildfires and the um, impact of prescribed burning, and we've been able to apply our similar model across all of those ages to see whether, in fact, there is a protective or um, other value in the use of prescribed burns. And this is, this is what we came up with, which was we were able to show from 2007 to 2021, and prescribed burns are in orange, that's the number of um, uh, hectares burnt, um, and uh, blue was the wildfires, um, a square kilometre, sorry. Um, and you can see that for most of those situations that we see high, larger wildfire years are more likely when there was more prescribed burning. Now, that needs more robust checking, but it seems as though there is some link that as we do larger scale burning, um, this is non-targeted, non-nuanced burning, um, that we may in fact not be alleviating fires. And, and this may be due to things such as that fine grass fuel buildup that David Bowman sp uh, spoke of. The corollary is, of course, smaller wildfire years mean more likely, uh, more likely when we have less prescribed burning. Again, this needs to be checked. If we put that into our model and we average from the one to six years period, that these are three-year running averages, we do show a weak to a slightly positive correlation um, between prescribed burning and, and the alleviation of wildfire area but it is a weak correlation. So the protective value of fire is probably of lesser importance than understanding what the impacts are on biodiversity. So what are those impacts on biodiversity? We're still working on those. Uh, there are probably um, a third of plant species in the Kimberley are sensitive to fire. There's probably a 15%, we're um, still evaluating numbers, of plant species alone that are hypersensitive to fire frequencies that are less than about five to six years. Some uh, require much longer fire-free intervals. So if we look at those fire maps again, here using a slightly different color scale, uh, prescribed burns and wildfires. And if we, if we look at those together and combine them, we can see that we start to get overlays in some of those areas, if I go back, we start getting overlays between the prescribed burn areas and wildfires because we're not guaranteeing that when we use a prescribed burn that we eliminate the incidence of a wildfire in those areas. This means that we are starting to therefore uh, have on those landscapes much higher frequencies. And so where we get those overlaps of higher frequencies, we will have impacts on species particularly threatened plants and animals. We've done a, a, a quick review um, and uh, I'll, I can't go into the intricate details of all the species, but for all of the species that we looked at, fire is a threat in 100% of all the Kimberley listed threatened plants and animals. So it's in all the conservation advisors and recovery plans. Where the impact of fire is known, high fire frequency is seen as one of the biggest negative impacts. Interestingly, low fire frequency is implicated in only 10% of uh, those conservation advices or recovery plants. High intensity fire, that is the really hot fires, is a threat to 65% uh, of species. What they say in those conservation plans is that fire regimes, if we're to protect threatened species, which are indicative of 
really protecting more species and getting higher biodiversity values will be about tight spatial and tempor temporal mosaicing, that is, on country cultural burning. And increased flammability from introduced grasses via a combination of grazing and too frequent fire is likely to be one of the great threats to those, those species. So um, um, one of the key species that we've already heard about from David and, and many of the traditional owners are very familiar with is Calitra Centropica, the white cypress. Um, this is Dave, uh, um, Donnie Imbalong. Um, Donnie just wants to speak for a couple of minutes to you all in the room from, from this video we recorded just a bit earlier this morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Donnie Imbalong. I'm a proud Jaru man from uh, my family groups from sort of east of Bulls Creek out in the desert. But I've uh, spent most of my life living up uh, on the coast near Clumbaroo at a place known as Alligator Camp. You know, I mean, the, the evidence is there. Wherever you drive around the Kimberley, you know, on the road to Warman, out to Clumbaroo and stuff, the, the country is changing for the worse. You know, big old trees are dying. You know, living out there with my grandparents and, and um, you know, learning about doing burn-offs at the right time of the year and and protecting our, our little um, part of the river. Um, I've, uh, over the time, have, have noticed, yeah, just within my short time living out there, um, the impact that a lot of the big uh, late-season fires had on the, the small isolated pockets of cypress pine in our area. Me and my grandparents, we... We, um, you know, just uh, to sort of run back, we, we looked after the small stands of, of cypress around our area. Um, and now, you know, 20, 20 or so years later, they're, they've grown quite sizably. I was out there a few months ago and on foot recorded roughly over 100 trees. Um, and yeah, a lot of, a lot of sizable trees and, and um, plenty of juveniles. One thing uh, that I would like to see come out of this fire forum is uh, more guess, robust talks and, and look at you know, the, the next generation getting back in touch with the country and and um, and uh, uh, an appreciation and respect for it. Because um, at the moment, yeah, you know, with the fire burning stuff, it is quite disconnected and. So so thank you, Donny. Um, so to conclude with, in this uh, very short time frame, better, better wrap it up a bit pretty quickly. Yeah, Thanks, we, Jess. Yeah, we have a world class biodiversity. We need to think differently. Um, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Catherine, fire will not improve a degraded system. We need to manage for all species, but importantly, treat the country with humility. Thank you very much.